Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, for the Caribbean Studies Program at the University of Toronto's annual conference, Diaspora Voices. Uh, the theme for this year is Crisis, Continuity, and Change. My name is Kevin Edmonds, and I teach here in the Department of Caribbean Studies, uh, currently the acting director of the program and one of the conference organizing committee members. So uh, before we go forward, I just wanted to give a brief uh, land acknowledgement, keeping in the minds of uh, keeping in mind the words of uh, a comrade Hayden King, cautioning us about these kind of repetitive, uh, unoriginal, um, routine land acknowledgements that happen uh, at at the start of a lot of these these events. Right. So, I just wanted to open up by acknowledging that today we are here on stolen land. Uh, if you've been to other events in the city, we're based in Toronto. You're likely familiar with the names of the Indigenous and First Nations listed in the land acknowledgements, the Yuran Wendat, the Patoon First Nations, the Seneca. What Hayden King had talked about in terms of um, these land acknowledgements talking as, as if the history was settled and that uh, for us at Caribbean Studies, we wanted to take the moment to ask uh, what we're actually doing to see decolonization come about, not just in theory, but in practice. Um, so for, for those of us that come from the Caribbean and many of us on the panel today, or in the audience uh, have a connection either directly or through the diaspora or families uh, to the region. So we, we need to acknowledge as well that we've been displaced from our homelands uh, due to histories of enslavement and indentureship, um, as well as the genocide that's happened in across the Americas, right? Um, so we need to acknowledge that stolen lands have also needed stolen bodies for labor and the theft and genocidal violence goes hand in hand. So. What we're also looking to do is to ask what our responsibilities are to Indigenous peoples here, as well as those in the Caribbean. So our futures are connected and what are we doing to repair and build futures together? Uh, these are questions that we don't have answers for yet, but as a program and community, we wanna put in the work in the context of solidarity to get there. I just wanted to take a moment to, to thank some of the people in our community, particularly uh, those in our little organizing committee who have made today's conference possible. So many, many thanks and respect to uh, Janae Knott, one of our own Caribbean Studies students for stepping up this year uh, as the, the conference coordinator. I also wanna thank Annette Quack, one of our new college librarians for volunteering to take on the complicated tech duties, not just today, but for many, many uh, hours and days and weeks leading up to the conference and giving us incredible insight on how to organize and improve things on our side. Uh, I also wanted to thank Kira McCloskey, who's doing an incredible job running the program social media. And a big thank you to uh, the new college principal, Bonnie McElhenney, Vice Principal Tara Goldstein, and the librarian, Jeff Newman, um, for their work on the New College Initiatives Fund, which has always helped uh, to, to make these conferences happen. So thank you all for um, you know, supporting my endless requests. Uh, we really appreciate that. And that's on behalf of the entire program. Uh, within the program, uh, I'll be quick. I wanted to thank uh, Professor Nestor Rodriguez, who sacrificed his research leave uh, so that we can bring programming like this to the community and offering, uh, and also wanted to thank him for offering his unmatched support and insight to keep things going. Uh, it's Professor Melanie Newton, uh, who will also be chairing uh, a panel, the third panel this afternoon. Uh, she's a force of nature and probably one of the only people who is capable of having U of T historians trend on Twitter in the past week, uh, and, and who is also um, the, the one who put this uh, idea of the undergraduate conference, the Diaspora, Diaspora Voices Conference in motion to begin with. Um, and last but not least, I just wanted to reach out to Alyssa Trotz, who uh, immediately responded very emphatically to our initial calls for help to get the conference off the ground, uh, as she always does, because she's an incredible person. And we're sending our love to you and your family uh, in Guyana during this time. Um, so, you know, just taking a deep breath for, for all of that, because uh, there's a lot of heavy stuff going on right now uh, in the community. And certainly the past year has been uh, very difficult for, you know, the community speaking particularly to the, the Caribbean people and the diaspora in terms of the devastating, often uh, unspeakable impact the pandemic has had on the lives, health and livelihoods of our families, friends and communities. And this is not something I'm speaking about in the abstract or in solidarity, speaking directly, personally, um, you know, from, from my experiences, but I've also heard from too many students, staff, and community members about the losses 
that they've personally faced, you know, and, and thinking about that in a moment where our provincial government shifting between, you know, policies rooted in, you know, blatant stupidity, you know, and now we're seeing it's deliberate neglect, um, that they're not just hurting us on purpose, but actively, um, you know, putting in policies that are killing many of the people that we love and live with. Um, so trying to transition out of, you know, such a somber moment, you know, you can get trapped easily in cliches about, you know, what's happened in terms of the losses that we face. Um, but something that comes to mind is that, you know, we're never going to be the same. And there's actually some truth in that because we need to take that anger, that sadness, that hurt, that frustration, and the often overwhelming feeling of isolation and turn that uh, both into very real and potential energy and turn that collectively back towards our community so we can ensure that for the system that's failed so many of us here in Ontario, in Toronto, but across the country and across you know, the world, things will indeed never be the same. Um, so within that heaviness and that hurt, um, I'm glad to see that there's also a space of community and that's where I see the positivity and I find a lot of strength in these times and it's what gives me hope. So it's that collective effort which has helped to make this conference possible is that collective effort which makes this program thrive and it allows us to build spaces where we don't only learn how to critique but to implement pathways to put those words into action and bring change by working together in what is the most radical of Caribbean traditions. So uh, just to wrap up I'm grateful to be part, part of this small but mighty community in Caribbean studies and I'm excited for today's conference um, where we'll learn today about the incredibly insightful and important work that Caribbean Studies students have created over the past year on our three undergraduate panels. Our first panel, Cultural Identity and Hybridity in the Caribbean, will be chaired by Professor uh, Ramabai Espine. Our second panel, uh, Contemporary Issues in the Hispanic Caribbean, will be chaired by Professor Nestor Rodriguez. And our third panel, Economic Institutions, Policy and Underdevelopment in the Region, will be chaired by Professor Melanie Newton. During the lunch intermission, we'll be treated to a steel parent performance by Tracy Soman and hear from one of our Caribbean uh, grad students, Judy Grant, who is on the ground organizing relief efforts in St. Vincent. Uh, after our third panel, we'll have the chance to connect with Chris Ramsroop and Gabriel Aladua, who have been fighting alongside the migrant workers in the fields of Southern Ontario for their rights. And they're gonna update us on some of the, you know, horrific situations that have emerged the last couple of days. Um, so these students and organizers, they're a major reason that I have hope that things can and will be better in the future. Uh, and I've been spoiled to have the opportunity to learn from so many of you. Uh, so with that, if you don't believe me, I will stop talking and we can transition to our first panel hosted by Professor Ramabai Espinay. Okay, hi, hi. Good morning all. And it's lovely to see so many of you here. Um, I have to say that this promises to be a really exciting panel and I'm sure we're all eager to hear our vibrant young presenters. The issues that they are talking about, cultural identity and cultural hybridity, are not new, of course, but it is instructive that even after several decades of academic and activist engagement, they remain relevant, vibrant, and as unsettled and potentially explosive as they always were. So uh, we are eager to hear you. And um, just, um, I, we, we have uh, four panelists listed. I am going to introduce three of them. Um, Kennedy, if you are presenting, I don't have your bio, so I'd like you to introduce yourself. And I'll begin with um, Chayana Sami. Chayana Sami is currently a master's student in the Department of History at the University of Toronto. She completed her undergraduate studies at U of T Scarborough with specialties in history, political science, and public law. Chayana's uh, current research looks at the rise of modern day nativism in the United States from the late 20th century to the present day, with a focus on the origins of the ideas of demographic, quote unquote, replacement. She's also interested in the Jamaican experience in North America and how it ties into the overall study of nativism. Um, the second presenter is Kalia Brown. 
Kalia Brown has recently completed the final year of undergraduate studies specializing in human geography and minoring and with a minor in Caribbean studies. She will be starting postgraduate studies in the fall uh, in geography and community development. Her area, um, yeah, that's her area. And she plans uh, to work on a major research paper on race and class in Trinidad uh, during the fall this year. Her academic interests are related to racism and colorism within the Caribbean diaspora. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the, uh, the next presenter um, is Gauri Basad. And Gauri um, will be finishing her undergraduate degree from U of T in June this year. Her program uh, is um, diaspora and trans, her programs, in fact, uh, diaspora and transnational studies, equity studies in English. Gauri tells us, and I quote here, because she gave us a little quote, um, through my time at U of T, I struggled a lot to find a space that accepted my Indo-Caribbean identity. Many spaces were polarized as extremely Caribbean and, however, associated with other non-Indo-Caribbean cultures. And other spaces were focused on mainland South Asian identity with little regard for the diaspora. This pushed her to uh, become interested in studying Indo-Caribbean identity politics. And uh, she has also organized the first pan-South Asian activist organization on campus, whose focus is women and minority issues in the diaspora by providing education, resources, and a space to have meaningful dialogue. I am going to ask each panelist to provide us with the title of her paper before she begins her presentation. And we begin with uh, Shayana. Um, I th am I unmuted? I think because I'm co-host, it let me unmute. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. So I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Just give me one moment. And I'm just going to start it. Um, my apologies. Perfect. Is that good for everybody? Yep, we can see it. Awesome. Okay, so um, at the request of the Professor, I'm my paper is titled "Indo Afro Cultural Influence in Jamaica and Its Canadian Diaspora," and I thank you all for the introduction and the ability to speak today. So I'm just going to get right into it because I <laughs> so perfect. Sorry, give me one second. Okay, so I'm just going to give a brief presentation agenda. So I just want to talk about what sparked my interest, research resources and methods, my standing argument paper contents and paper contributions and avenues for future research. So before I kind of speak about what sparked my interest, I think there's been much attention paid to the experience of Indian immigrants in the Caribbean, including Jamaica. However, far less attention has been paid to the group that has emerged from the interactions between Indo and Afro Jamaicans. And this project looked at the development of this fused group in Jamaica. And I'm speaking from a firsthand experience as like when I'm gonna be speaking about an interview I conducted with a close family contact that is from that group. Um, I just wanna talk about the mass arrival of Indian immigrants to the mid to late 19th century and the form of labor migrations and the cultural amalgamation through, through the early to mid 20th century. And yeah, that's what I've really wanted to focus on. I'm gonna mention my resources and my methods, my argument a bit later. I just wanted to kind of set the stage. So for what sparked my interest, I grew up in Durham region eating at this restaurant. It was blur just for privacy, but I'll just say it now, they're okay with it. It's called Roland's. And it's a restaurant that did a mix between Indian food, Chinese food and Jamaican and traditional Jamaican food, which was really interesting. And I always grew up eating it and I never knew how fused it was, but that's how, eating this my whole life. And I've always heard about the familial connections of being part of this group, but this pushed me to look at it more deeply and really figure out these experiences and everything like that. That's why I was interested in the project. So in terms of 
resource, research resources and methods, I consulted a wide variety of secondary sources in the development of this paper, as well as primary, but in the first sections that look at context of Indian immigration, they've mostly been based on secondary sources, articles and books, because like as the professor mentioned, there's been vast, this, this re, there's been a lot of research on that and very good research. And if anyone's particularly interested, I can share my bibliography in the um, chat. I also have it in the slideshow, but if anyone has like any specific questions. And then the second section that talks about like permanent settlement and cult cultural amalgamation is focused mostly on books and secondary sources as well. But in both of these, for the first section, I use stereographs as a primary source, just to kind of show the conditions of specific, specifically on indentured plantations. I use newspaper clippings as well as these stereographs throughout the paper. But the last section is where this actually gets very, very interesting. I actually conduct, conducted interviews for this paper for the final seminar project. I don't know um, if you've heard of her, Professor Sharma was the one that led this project with me. Um, I conducted interviews with a member of this Indo-Afro-Canadian diaspora, a very, very close family contact. And I asked them about specifically about recipes and how food has been a way to be in connection with their culture, cultural history, cultural hybridity, and also in creating something unique. Yeah, so that's just like the remaining cultural grasps have been really important. So my standing argument when I did this is I've argued that Indian immigrants were not only well established in the islands and abroad because of their economic labor history, but their long lasting cultural roots have led to an influence on Jamaican culture, as well as a blend of those cultures. So and I do want to mention because I'm going to be talking about paper contents now, I did do a brief literature review and term section in the paper, but this is only a 10 minute presentation and we I tackled a lot of content so I'm going to leave that out and again I can I'm more than willing to drop those in the chat if anyone particularly wants it I have that ready, but yeah so. I just want to talk about what I've done in the project thus far. So the first section talks about Indian immigration and context. So after emancipation in the 19th century Jamaica, the formerly slave run plantation economy did not just di did not dissipate, but it transformed. You don't see the plantations were still very much used as a means of labor, even if it wasn't via slave labor. And so the need for cheap and exploitative, I think I just, that's like the underlying word I would want to speak about, exploitative labor was extremely important. And so indenture contracts, and you'll see, these are indenture laborers in the, on the stereograph on the, on the um, screen working on a plantation. Um, the indentured, pro, indenture was prominent between 1845 and 1917, but it is important and I do want to be brief because I'm going to mention this a couple times. These systems didn't existed simultaneously. It wasn't that slavery happened at one time and indenture happened at one time and this happened at one time. There were obviously people that settled and everything in between these periods. I'm just discussing it as like these general categories are still useful to understand. And for anyone that doesn't know, indenture is an agreement of free passage contractually obligated to work in the country. So if someone was coming from India, they get free passage to Jamaica from their plantation owner, food, shelter, and then they'd be obligated to work for a set amount of years. And that <laughs> those years were not always honored in the contract, but that's a whole other <laughs> discussion. Um, so yeah, bulk of 1845 to 1917, about 37,000 people. And there were multiple waves and they were mainly from Northern India. So Madras or Calcutta. And the route of passage was really between the port of Calcutta and Jamaica's main port city, Port Royal. And the indentured conditions were absolutely horrendous. It was coined the new slavery. And it Jamaica looked deceptively attractive because the British had made the political situation in India so tenuous and plantation owners were liars. <laughs> this is simply as you can put it, that it made things look a lot better than it was. And there was a lot of hostility between, especially even from Afro-Caribbean immigrants as well, um, Afro-Caribbean members of the community because of this, I, this people, these plantation owners were exploitively using Indian labor to undercut wages and all that stuff. And that led to major hostility, but that hostility is not what I want to focus on because that's not where someone like me came from. It came from sharing and hybridity. And this is another stereograph is just interesting. You can see these villages really starting to form. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about permanent settlement. So again, brief mention, it's not, it hasn't just been 
between there's multiple categories and it was widespread between 1916 and 1920 when these labor contracts concluded and it was mostly in rural areas but you also saw people in Kingston as well where there was a lot of um cultural mixing and so how does labor settlement fit in again with the ending of contracts musical hybridity even was very important soca music one of the most popular forms of music in Jamaica was heavily has heavily been influenced by Indian culture. Cannabis, which has also been connected to Rastafarianism, was introduced, not introduced, but strongly incorporated by Indian immigrants to the island. But these things are all papers of their own. I just wanted to mention them, give them their due diligence. But I'm going to be talking about food. And so Jamaican curry powder, for example, is not the exact same as Indian curry very much connected to British curry. If you look at um, Jamaica's main dishes, some of our most popular dishes, like our most popular cultural dishes, stewed chicken, curry goat, soup, etc. It's all very, very mixed. And yes, so I'm going to be talking about now the diaspora. So here, these are all pictures I've taken myself. I've included two recipes for curry goat and West Indian pumpkin curry soup. And two of the main ingredients that you see in both are Jamaican curry powder and Scotch bonnet peppers. So for curry goat with white rice, um, and I'm just going to leave this up. I obviously can't read through the entire recipe, but the person that actually gave these recipes is an Indo-Afro immigrant themselves, um, immigrated to Canada at the age of 14, over 30 years ago, and really uses food to intrinsically connect him back to his culture. And so I'm going to leave the recipe here again, if anyone wants it, I can send it. But as you've seen by Jamaican food, we, we use a lot of ingredients. Um, and also this takes even longer, the West Indian pumpkin and curry soup that uses all of these ingredients. I did want to go into them more, but with some of the disruptions, I, I realize I'm low on time and I want to get to some of the quotations. So I think one of the, I also asked, aside from getting the recipe listings and everything, I'd also asked the interviewee what cooking meant to them in terms of sticking on to their culture and moving and, and also creating something new. And this is, I just want to read this passage very quickly before I conclude, because this was very important. So this is what it read. The city Indian Black and the country Indian Black differ as much as any city in any country population ever does. In the country where I'm from, we were able to include a vast and varied amount of ingredients into a pot being stirred by Indians that were respected and considered out of many one people. I had old respected Rastafarians, people of the church and cooks in the hills with the same long curly hair as mine. Korean Indian influence automatically found itself in all of these yet to be established in making dishes. One of my fondest memories to be as cliche as it may be was the cookout where you could look across and see different faces preparing meals, oxtail, curry goat, callaloo and corn, and you could not help but embrace every seasoning and every flavor of the parish. And so I'm just going to conclude. So the specifics and first person account of this diaspora is where I think this project really fit in and why it was so interesting, being able to ask how food connected them back to their culture and how that brought about. And again, I had more quotations, but that was just the one I wanted to single out for the 10 minute presentation, because it was a 30 page paper. Um, and I think any further research would be interesting, particularly with Trinidad and Guyana, which have an even larger Indian influence, but obviously that's not the part of the group that I'm from. So I spoke from my perspective and I will stop talking. And if anyone has any questions, thank you so much. And I'm sorry for a bit of the disjointedness. Thank you. And I'll stop share. And here's my bibliography if anyone wants to see. Great, I believe we're moving on to the next panelist and then we're gonna have questions at the end if that's correct. Perfect. Stop sharing. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, Kyla, are you ready to go? Um, yeah, I'll just share my screen. All right, so um, thank you to Shayana because you've covered a lot of the things that I was gonna just preface at the beginning of my presentation too, so that helps a lot. Um, my paper is about diaspora and religion, so the Indo-Caribbean Hinduism, and um, 
the reason that I decided to write this paper was because I took a course on Caribbean religions. Um, Professor Dominguez, I'm sure some of you are familiar with him. Um, and we focused on a lot of different sort of like Afro-Caribbean religions and also indigenous Caribbean religions, but we didn't really make it to Hinduism um, just for a lack of time, but I figured it would be something interesting to write about. And I know I've already been introduced. I did just recently complete, complete my undergrad at U of C and I will be starting my postgrad at U of C in a few months as well. And part of the reason why I focus so much on the Indo Caribbean diaspora is because I'm partially a part of it, just the same as Cheyenne. Um, and cultural hybridity is what I am sort of the result of. And I have chosen to focus on Hinduism as well because in the Caribbean, it's such a small percentage of people there. Um, in Trinidad and Guyana and Suriname, the percentages are a bit larger. So like 18, 20%, that sort of thing. But in all the other islands, if you look at the stats, less than 1% of the population are practicing Hindus. And although we see the Indian influence all throughout the Caribbean, we don't really spend a lot of time talking about their religions or them as the group themselves. And of course, like all other religions in the Caribbean, the Hinduism has been sort of creolized and is distinctly different from Hinduism in India or Sri Lanka or East Asia in general. Uh, of course, we know that the religion was brought over by indentured workers from East Asia and in Trinidad, they landed in 1845 and in Guyana, they landed in 1838. And as Cheyenne had mentioned earlier, these indentured laborers were brought over to subsidize the slave labor when the slave trade was abolished. And though indentureship was also very exploitative, it was not the same as slavery. And that can be seen um, even through religion, the fact that they were able to ret retain so much of it. And they were in some aspects allowed to freely practice their religions, but not always. Um, planters had their limits. For example, while they tolerated much of Indian culture, one practice for, in which a devotee would pierce various points of his flesh with hooks and swing from a pole proved too barbaric for British Guyana and it was outlawed. Uh, that's a quote from Vor Vordebeck. And Indentured laborers, obviously, as I said, were able to more freely practice their religion, and, but they could not do so as they pleased because it was regulated by planters. So they had to wait until they had more means and acquired money and land, and then they were able to physically manifest the religion and have places where they could worship. And the most common way that this is represented is through jandis. And I don't know if you guys can see, but in that picture over there, that's just a picture that I took randomly in Trinidad, those flags are jandis. So jandis are colorful consecrated flags on long bamboo sticks placed on the north side of someone's property or home. And they signify the purification of a new home and is symbolic of Hindus accepting the Caribbean as their new home. And that's why you always see them on the north side of homes in the Caribbean. And I'm sure anyone that's been to Trinidad or Guyana has seen many, many of these flags. And in terms of caste, so some of you may know that in India or just in Hinduism in general, caste is very, very important. It's pretty much synonymous with class and people who share a caste generally don't mingle outside of it or they intermarry. And if you look at this pyramid, um, the Brahmins are at the top, they're the priestly caste. And then the bottom of three are generally the people that migrated to the Caribbean. So they were considered to be of low caste. And as you can see, there's the manual laborers and those are pretty much the people that migrated to the Caribbean. Um, although some did change like their last names to 
make it seem as though they were of a higher caste when they came to their Caribbean because it was a new life and they could basically just choose what they wanted. And even though it was important to Hindus that came over, planters didn't recognize it. Everyone was just a laborer. It didn't matter what caste they were. So they were all forced to intermingle and live in the same areas and all communicate with each other. And it's something that likely would not have happened back in East Asia, but they didn't have a choice in, in places like Trinidad and Guyana. And though different castes did migrate, many of the migrants shared similar back backgrounds and motives for their migration. So for example, initially most of the indentured laborers were men and many John Lees were dedicated to Hanuman because he symbolized overcoming adversity and it was for fitting for single men in a foreign land. And of course, overcoming adversity in the face of, you know, working under exploited planters and whatnot, it was important. And caste does remain important in East Asia today. Um, it's even in like pop culture. If anyone watches Bollywood movies, there's, they talk about stuff like that all the time. But in the Caribbean, the religion has become a bit more homogenized because everyone was forced to live together. And this was also likely the result of being isolated together in a region and culture completely different from their own. Um, Hindus in the Caribbean did not have the luxury of squabbling between themselves over caste left in, in Asia, and they were able to build strong communities as well as amass a decent amount of wealth and were able to build physical places of worship. So one example is the Sudas Sadhu Temple in the sea in Trinidad. It was built during the 1940s. Um, and that's just a picture of it over there. And it's important because the man who built it was a laborer and he would travel back to India just to be able to worship and it was getting too expensive. So he decided to start building a temple, but planters were not pleased and actually ordered him to have to tear it down. And he refused and they jailed and fined him. And they tried to find someone else to tear down the temple and everyone on the island basically refused and they had to outsource the labor and find uh, a British man to tear it down. And the legend goes that that man died a few, I think it was a few weeks or a few months later. So it was bad luck. He's not supposed to tear down temples. But that's just another example of Hindu solidarity. They wouldn't, they wouldn't betray their own, I guess. And um, the temple was representative of all Hindu traditions. It wasn't meant for a certain caste and it didn't pander to a specific group of people who had certain rituals. It was just for every Hindu there. So I wanted to next talk about some of the social impacts of Hinduism. And there are a few negative ones. I know Cheyenne was talking about that earlier and that there is racism and things that we won't really touch on right now. I just want to focus on the positives. Um, but they have their own schools and political parties and stuff. And I don't think that's very helpful, but uh, they do exist. But more positive things that they have influenced are music. So Hindu songs sung while honoring or showing devotion to their gods, or even songs that would be sung to celebrate marriage or the birth of a child have been passed down orally for generations in the mother tongue, the mother tongue, and they were usually passed down by women. And they were accompanied by dancing and musical instruments. Um, if anyone's ever been to a Caribbean Indian wedding, you guys have definitely seen this. And the songs were also typically sung in Hindi. So the, mu the music remained specific to Hindus and other groups of people couldn't really participate. I mean, they could hear, but they didn't really understand. And it wasn't something they were really involved in. However, in the 1980s, these forms of music and Hindu culture became a bit more successful or not successful, accessible when chutney music emerged. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with chutney. Uh, it has a very, very distinct sound. It, I feel like this picture probably represents chutney music very well. 
but it is a mix of Hindu traditional songs and forms of singing and music and art and expression, as well as Creole Calypso. And similar to Calypso, Chutney began as a form of social and political commentary, and it remains so to this day, although sometimes it can just be, you know, just funny songs about ridiculous things, buying bread, that whatever it may be, but generally it tells a story. And the music can be easily identified by the distinct tone and accompanied by East Asian melodies and instruments. You can always tell a Chutney song based on the way that the person is singing. It's very, very, very East, East Asian or Indian. And the first Chutney song that was released was called Chutney Soka by Drupati, I'm gonna butcher this and I'm sorry, Ram Gunai. Um, that's her in that picture there. And the song was about her growing up as an Indian girl in her village and wanting to dance to Calypso or Soka and her being Indian and not really being a whole part of it. And so she made her own form of music that her and her people could also partake in and then other people could join in too. So I think there's a video, the original video for this song, she's performing in a bar and there's all different kinds of people enjoying the music, even though it seems distinctly Indian. And with Chutney music, you often see people performing in traditionally Indian clothing. So like saris and I'm not, I can't remember what the, the, the men's version of that is, but you'll see them accompanied by Indian dancers as well. And that's just very normal. It's part of the culture that they have retained. So in conclusion, even though Hinduism was not entirely suppressed in the Caribbean, it was not immune to outside influences and is evident in the practices that remain. I didn't get to get to everything. It's just kind of a short presentation. I know we're short on time right now. Um, but within the religion, the language, and of course the culture that emerged from the unique combination of Indo and African and Afro-Caribbean people is amazing. Uh, as we, we will all see, cultural hybridity is very important in the Caribbean and has resulted in a lot of exciting things, including, you know, chutney music and a more homogenized form of Hinduism that isn't as polarizing as it may be in East Asia, where, you know, there's the, the bottom tier people that you're not allowed to touch. And then there's the top tier, although Brahmins did try and intervene in the Caribbean a little bit. And there are some Hindus that um, have more power or say within the temple. It's just, it's not the same thing as it is in East Asia. And I feel like the religion as a whole is much more inclusive to all of its followers. And um, however, Hinduism in the Caribbean is still relatively early in its conception and there's still much to come. It only got to the region in the 19th century. So we'll, we'll see what else changes in the next few years. Anyway, uh, here's my bibliography and thank you all very much. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you. Hi, Kalia. Um, Kalia? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I just quickly had one question just related to your presentation. And if anybody else is able to answer that, please feel free. Um, my name's Kennedy. Um, I was just interested in the Jandis. I think I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. I was very, very like surprised to realize that they weren't, they, do, do they exist outside of India? Um, I mean, do they exist within India or is it out only for communities and people who have migrated out or is it only something that emerged after indentureship? Um, yeah, can you just talk about that a bit more if you can? Um, yeah, curious. no, they do exist in India, but it's more of a Northern Indian things and you'll see them. I wrote about it in the full essay, but I didn't include it in this presentation. But yeah, they do still exist in India, but you don't see them as often. Um, I'm not entirely sure why, uh, but I imagine it has a lot to do with what they represent, which is the cleansing of a new home. And mm -hmm. for the Indians coming to the Caribbean, the, the entire place was a new home, you know? So they're very, very common. And they're also 
usually beside a little place where you pray. So it's not unique to the Caribbean, but you see it way more in the Caribbean. It also has a lot to do with the people that came from India. So it's, there's not as much diversity in the types of people that came um, in the sense that they all shared a lot of, of the same practices. And in India, you'll find a lot of many, many different groups. But as like Cheyenne was saying, a lot of people came from Calcutta and that sort of thing. So because they came from similar regions, they shared similar practices. And that's what you see represented in the Caribbean. OK, thank you. Thank you. And yeah, I'll share the bibliography with you guys. All right, next up, I believe we have uh, Shania. I'm just going to spotlight you. Okay, can everybody see my presentation? Can you see the first, the first slide? Okay, awesome. So good morning, chairs, um, esteemed guests, fellow presenters, and everyone in attendance. My name is Kennedy Providence, and I'm a third year student, just finishing my third year of undergrad. Um, I'm doing a double major of bi biology and health and disease and a minor in Caribbean studies. So that is how I ended up here. Um, I was first introduced to the new college and Caribbean studies classes when I was, I had a die, terrible feeling of homesickness and I needed something that connected me back to the region. and. I took a course on revolutions with Kevin and you know from that course I loved it so much that I changed my degree and be, and be, joined the faculty so that is just a brief introduction on me I was born in Toronto and grew up and lived in Trinidad and Tobago um, up until 2018 when I moved to Toronto for university and you know I want to contribute to our ongoing rich discussion of cultural identity and hybridity in the Caribbean. And I want to discuss a novel that I think truly encapsulates this segment of the conference um, perfectly. Um, I was first introduced to the novel in question, which is Tessa McWatt's Shame on Me, An Anatomy of Race and Belonging, in a course that I took last fall that was taught by the chair of this section, actually, Professor Espiny. And, you know, out of all the amazing work that Professor Espiny introduced us to, done by women of the Caribbean diaspora, including some of her own incredible work, such as The Swinging Bridge, we looked at Bard and so many other texts, McGuat's novel was really one that of my favorites. It emerged as the favorite and it resonated with me in this indescribable way. So I wanna look at cultural identity, but more focusing on hybridity, through the lens of Tessa McWatt's novel, Shame on Me. I was really able to in, insert myself into the novel and see myself as McWatt. And it did help that I grew up in Trinidad in a comfortable middle-class family. You know, I did live a quite privileged life and that did aid in my sense of belonging. However, it wasn't until moving to Toronto that I began to felt began to feel uncomfortable. And that was like a discomfort within myself. I never felt like a personal discomfort before. And, you know, I was many people's first black friend or I became the representative of the Caribbean and the, and the black community at the same time, which you can imagine is a huge burden carrying the weight of those two communities and especially in some, for someone who has never had to do that before, it was very, very exhausting and draining. And, you know, adding to that, it came the scrutiny of my appearance. I am a mixed race woman and, you know, my hybridity is evident in my features, my physical features. You know, people will comment on how exotic I looked, how exotic I sounded, ask me what I was mixed with all kind of things. They asked me if we built rafts in the Caribbean, if I knew what Facebook was, all kind of thing. And, you know, all this is really to see that after feeling alone in my sentiments for, for so long, I felt like a weight had been lifted off of my shoulders when I was introduced to this authentic, non-fictional book that addressed so many of my feelings and experiences head on. 
And, you know, after reading it for class, I wanted to share it everywhere. I sent copies to friends who were part of the Caribbean diaspora and to people who weren't part of the Caribbean diaspora. I sent it to people who were part of the wider Black, Indigenous, people of color community around the world and people who weren't even part of that community. Because I really, truly believe that this novel was so relevant and relatable that there was something for everyone in it. And, you know, even for readers who weren't able to grasp or understand every microaggression or macroaggression that is experienced by persons of color or by mixed race people, at least they were, there was some introduction to the more intimate experiences faced by these, <clears throat> excuse me, by these communities. Because, you know, we do hear about the unfortunate but more common microaggressions of, um, you know, what are you, what are you mixed with, all these things. But, you know, this book really deals with intimate, these shameful experiences of being a hybrid, what that means, that ostracization, that alienation that is felt. And so to quickly summarize the novel, McWatt draws readers, oops, right. So to quickly summarize the novel, McWatt draws readers into her raw personal journey of self-identification through um, journey of self-identification, discovery and reconstruction of identity by incorporating um, familial anecdotes, by inserting herself into genetic databases like she does a 23andMe, she um, signs up at Ancestry.com and does a genetic map. Um, and by referencing these biased scientific literatures in an attempt to reclaim and rewrite her identity by deconstructing herself, as well as these formulated barriers of race, race, ethnicity, and discrimination that both accompanied and followed colonialism. Herself, a light-skinned, mixed-race, middle-class, all-around ergo privileged female, McQuart's migration from the Caribbean to suburban Canada unseats this sense of belonging that she feels, and it lures her to pursue the impact of migration and the resulting inevitable diversification of the Caribbean region and its diaspora. So my original paper showcased this post-colonial discourse of writing back to the empire and resistance writing, using McWatt really as the main character, examining these consequences of colonialism and the realization and relevance of imperialism and the remnants of the plantocracy in the 21st century. So just to continue along the train of thought, if you look at the screen, I have included the cover page of the book um, that will become more relevant later on with the disjointedness of the body. And I've also attached a picture of the author. So to continue along this train of thought, I inserted a quote from the chapter of the book titled Experiment, which is the second chapter. And it has a subtitle called, What Are You? a question that I'm sure most of us have been at least asked once in our lives. It goes, I am the result of movement of bodies on ships, as captains, as cargo, as indentured servants, as people full of hope for a chance of survival. I also come from people who nearly annihilated by those who arrived. And, you know, when we look at this quote, we can begin to connect the dots between cultural identity and hybridity, you know, from that first Colombian exchange, followed by the transatlantic slave trade and after that period of indentureship that the two previous presenters spoke of in depth. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Excuse me. Yeah, that period of indentureship that followed, many African and East Indian people were taken from their homes and forcibly scattered and displaced throughout the world within the Carib with the Caribbean receiving the bulk of the shipment. We did receive the majority of Africans, enslaved Africans and indentured East Indian laborers. And here we see the origins of hybridity. And if you couple this with the innate human response to explore and migrate willingly, we can really begin to think about how widespread the hybridization of the Caribbean region actually is. And that it is a direct consequence of colonialism. And in another quote from chapter eight of the novel, um, Blood, 
McWatt writes, 